Uh, many thanks for the introduction. Uh, many thanks to the organizers for bringing this conference uh, the second time, actually, to Prague, uh, my, my home place. Uh, I'm really glad to see you all here. My name is Jakub. I uh, work for a company called Flyer for Hospitality. I'm responsible for a data science platform. And um, as the title said, I would like to introduce you what built-in concurrency primitives and um, Python offers and how to scale to large scale distributed computing. The content approximately will be an introduction uh, to concurrency parallelism. Uh, I will then show Python's built-in primitives for concurrency and then we will go into scaling out and I'll, I'll show you some um, examples how uh, how to scale based on what we've learned from the built-in Python. So let's start. Um, so what concurrency is, or what it actually enables you, it can basically enable weighting efficiently. Uh, or other, otherwise said, it, it can enable you doing other things while waiting for results or some, some inputs, outputs. Could be often it's um, API responding, so basically, imagine you are waiting in multiple queues, for example, at once, and that, that is a concurrency. Um, I wish uh, our country would learn how to operate multiple queues. This is some ancient picture, or not that ancient, a couple of decades ago, uh, where people waited in que long queues without knowing what the queues were for often, or what the stock was, so that, um, now it uh, looks funny, it was not funny that time. <laughs> um, so it, uh, concurrency would also let you organize your work efficiently. Uh, for example, if you're accepting some request for work, you can just you know respond politely, yeah, I will do it. You write a note and then eventually you will do it and respond to uh, the request. Or you, you can efficiently dispatch to multiple queues, multiple workers, uh, and that's what we will show how, how to do efficiently and how to do it with Python API. We al always remember there's some context switching, so it's not a cure for every task to do concurrently. There's some overhead from context switching. Uh, parallelism um, is often involved with concurrency, often, often connected to it, but what it really enables is to execute mul multiple things at once. Uh, concurrency does not need parallelism, although very often it's typically desired. Uh, and this talk is especially for data processing, uh, machine learning contexts. And there we usually care about both. Uh, an example is uh, vectorizing, vectorized CPU operations are parallel. We, we have, in our laptops, we have multiple cores that uh, operate in parallel, so that's um, that's another example. Uh, where do we need concurrency? I mentioned already, um, typically web servers, high performance computing, data engineering, machine learning, these are very broad concepts. Uh, um, maybe everyone would find they, uh, they position in, in each of them. When to decide where to go concurrency parallelism, I use a um, very frequent analogy to coffee machines, how concurrency and parallelism can be compared. So with uh, a single machine, you can have you can serve multiple queues, but you still uh, produce uh, one coffee at a time. So the time to process this is, um, if you pr uh, project the time on a vertical uh, scale, it, it takes longer while parallelism actually like, brews two coffee at the same time. Uh, but you can still make two people happy at the same time with either of these two con uh, concepts. Um, in, in data processing, uh, we often really care about both. We need our processes to be responsive. That's where basically concurrency is, is applicable. We also need to process efficiently and fast. And that's where parallelism is uh, mostly used. So let's, uh, let's take a look into Python build in concurrency primitives. The, um, the module that I'm going to talk about most is concurrent futures. Um, 
which was proposed um, in 2009. I think it was introduced in Python 3.5. Then it's, it's a very concise. There's not too much stuff in there, but it very nicely shows the abstraction, the API, and it also provides implementation for uh, concurrent primitives. There are other modules, uh, threading, multiprocessing, subprocess, async IO, I'll also cover a bit, but I don't, will not go into details of either of these. So let's start looking into concurrent futures because it's it's a kind of nice learning journey how to how to get in touch if even if you're a beginner in this world how to understand concurrency especially in a Python context. Uh, the first object we are looking at the first type is executor. Uh, there's a very abstract description in the documentation. But if we break it down, what it really does, it's what, and if you look at the API, the methods of this, um, uh, this class of this type, uh, we need to create an executor, choose some parameters. Uh, we can submit tasks to the executor. We can collect results, wait for those results, and then we eventually shut down the executor. So that's the life cycle of our concurrent, um, concurrent uh, programming or concurrent uh, workloads we do with an executor. Uh, so to see these in code examples, to create an executor, there's two particular ones in uh, Python built-in, thread pool and process pool executor. Both can take a uh, maximum workers parameter, and um, I think the, the names are quite self-explanatory. They either use threads or processes to create workers where tasks are executed. The next step is we submit the tasks or tasks to the executor. Let's uh, say we do some, um, we need to do some math, a very complex one in this case. And we, we want to do, uh, calculate a single result. Uh, let's use a thread executor now, uh, just in this, as an example, but works with any executor. And we call a submit uh, method, so that's a principal one. Uh, and we pass the, the reference to the function, and we also pass the arguments, the parameters. Now, uh, note says that we do not call directly the function here. So basically, we, we let the executor to somehow call, somehow execute the function inside, and the executor decides how, when, where, it does it. We can also use a map method, which is very similar to the built-in map function, and um, uh, returns um, uh, an iter iterable object or generator. So map obviously do um, execute or potentially execute the the function on um, in. Um, a collection, um, an iterable object. Here we just use a branch. So how do we how do we collect results? Uh, we can look at a single result, and then we meet the second, um, maybe even the most important um, type in the concurrent futures, which is called future. Uh, so if we look at the result of um, the previous calculation or the preview submit call, uh, it would show us future something that it shows us a state. In this case, it's already finished, but it may not be. Um, so future is a, a placeholder, basically a promise of an eventual calculation and result returned. Uh, it may end up in not being finished, it may end up in an uh, exception, an error, but it also hopefully ends up in being finished and returning the result we are interested into. So the result is to be fetched by uh, the result method. You can also put a timeout, so the result now is, is blocking. So when we call result, we are actually waiting in our code. In contrast to submit, so submit would not block the, the execution of your main, of the, of, the func of the caller, it will just return future instantly. 
Uh, we can also request or uh, ask the future object whether it's done. We can also request to cancel that um, execution. When we want to collect multiple results, um, if we use the map, we basically uh, need to iterate over the results, and the, the generator written by the map returns always the uh, so result one by one as they, as they become available. There's some shortcoming. If we start with a slow task, it may actually block the faster ones if they are after it. So maybe this is not the optimum um, way if, um, unless you want all the results at once anyways. We can also use a bit more advanced and fine-tuned uh, functions in concurrent futures. Uh, if you use as completed, we can, uh, um, uh, so we, instead of map, for example, we can just get a list of futures by calling submit multiple times, uh, which I do in, um, in, this, uh, bit, in this first line. Now, if we have multiple fu uh, futures, we can use as completed for these futures to, to wait for, um, uh, to actually get a generator uh, that yields the completed ones as soon as, the, uh, as there is any completed. Um, another function which is even probably more powerful and more fine grade is wait. Uh, uh, we can either wait for the first completed, we can wait for all the completed, but we can also um, wait for the first exception. So if it's the first completed, uh, it again gives us timely the first result that is available, and it returns actually two sets of uh, futures, the ones that are done and the ones that are not done yet. We may at this point decide what to do with these that are not done you can, for example, cancel them because we say, let's say we call four APIs or do four calculations and then we are just interested in the first, uh, the fastest one and we just cancel the slow ones. Uh, at the very end, we uh, need to shut down the executor. Typically, we don't do it explicitly. Um, often it would be just uh, the end of your the, the Python process that created the executor. Uh, and uh, maybe if, if it's not that case, more often one would use the context manager if we need to manage the life cycle of the executor, which is very convenient. You don't need to call these methods um, one by one. The, the, what the shutdown really does or should do is to free up any resources. So if we spawn processes, we would like to um, and kill those processes if you don't need the executor anymore. Um, one um, example that uh, may not be obvious why and what happens if uh, one wants to do a, one wants to do a, with the process executor a list of uh, random numbers, random integers in this case. So the first one would, should yield eight random integers from zero to 100, but what it really does is it always yields the very same uh, number, which is not random. I mean, first execution, this is still, could be still random, but very low probability. If you execute it next and next time, you would still get these. Um, the, the explanation behind is Rent in this next, not, not actually a standard pure function. There's an object behind which maintains its state. And in the process executor, we clone that state, but we don't update it in, in, in the worker processes. Um, so don't get, th there are some pitfalls you can fall into if, you, uh, if one is not um, careful. Uh, one limitation for thread pool, and I think it's famous or infamously known, is the global interpret lock or GIL. We, you may know in future, not too far future versions, this may not be um, a limitation anymore, but it still is. However, we know also probably that the GIL can be released 
either by IO operations, so especially for IO operations that will execute is, is the goods, or with extensions like NumPy, Pandas, TensorFlow that are implemented in the C, that those also release uh, GIL. So if you have NumPy in threads, they can run efficiently in parallel. For process pool, there's a different limitation, um, which is serialization. So in in process in um, executor process, uh, we need to pickle serialize. So we the the concurrent features use the um, built-in C pickle method or um, module. So for example, if we want to submit a lambda. Uh, the the outcome is in pickling error because uh, C pickle cannot cannot pickle lambdas. There are other um, n unpickable objects, so we need to be we need to always send something that can be serialized. Uh, what how can we help? How can we resolve those? Um, there's one very nice project uh, from the Joplip uh, uh, world. It's called Loki. It's very similar, basically a drop-in replacement for process pool executor, but on the back end, it uses Cloud Pickle. So the best Cloud Pickle is a serialization library that can pickle things like lambdas because it takes a bit different approach how to serialize code. And there's also Dill behind besides Cloud Pickle that can do it. Um, so if process pool executor is what you would like to have and you would be limited by pickling, then there's this just drop in one to one replacement that can um, that can help. How concurrent futures integrate or work with uh, async IO? So async IO, just a short recap, don't want to go into details is a cooperative multitasking concept. Uh, we use the async await syntax. It executes uh, coroutines in using an event loop manager or an event loop task switching. So it's, it's a slightly different implementation of concurrency compared to concurrent futures. A bit confusingly, async IO has also a future type which is not the same as concurrent futures future. Um, I think the naming makes sense because it really does almost, this, it basically does the same, just it has different API. Uh, and because it's so similar, we can convert between uh, concurrent futures future and async IO futures, uh, either by using async IO wrap future that's one way to uh, to convert. Or maybe even more often, we would uh, we would use loop method run in executor. So if we, if we have an executor and want to uh, execute something basically a bit out of async IO uh, governance, we we can we can uh, run it in an executor like that and get an async IO future directly. So fundamentally, basically, this is, this removes the traditional, or at least the traditional perceived limitation of async IO not supporting CPU bound task concurrency or parallelism. So it this is very nice easy way how to how to make this available in async IO directly. A um, few practical examples. Um, I think we could find much, much, uh, much, much more. Uh, I've picked, picked two. If we want to do some quick, or maybe even not quick, but just quickly coded Perl batch processing, as for example, running Pandas pipelines on multiple files, Grid search, uh, hyperparameters, doing it with a um, probably a process pool executor, for example, here and just spawning the processes is very simple way to let you orchestrate that um, either on your machine or some other machine if if you log in uh, remotely. 
uh, non-blocking data processing in the web server. Uh, this would be especially relevant if that web server is, is implemented in async IO. Say we have fast API, we want some API endpoints to do heavy, heavier CPU bound task, but still want to maintain the async IO concurrency. If we plug in um, and uh, process pool or even could be a threat pool executor in and use the um, uh, the async I integration I showed just before uh, we can turn we can, we can um, eff uh, efficiently have that web server still responsive enough or if if we do streaming could be similar instead of fast API one can imagine some pops up uh, queue um, any any messaging uh, coming with um, coming in when the process of that receives the messages needs to be responsive. What we need to be careful in uh, any case is resource utilization and in particular memory because if we run out of memory, uh, what happens typically is uh, something gets uh, killed and uh, often we even don't know what actually it is or it is going to be. So I've showed so far the build in, um, with a small exception of Loki, the build in uh, API, the basically the the abstraction of um, executor of futures, how it can be used, and now we are going to see how this uh, knowledge, the, the same concepts, basically can be. Um, used and I should could say scaled towards this larger scale distributed computing. I will use two um, frameworks, Dask and Ray. This talk is not about showing all the details or not even about comparing these two. So I'll just show that basically the same, that the concepts from concurrent futures and built-in um, abstractions are present in these um, in these big um, big data frameworks. So what happens now? We want to scale out. Um, what 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 could be the driver? We we need to process huge data sets. Um, we the calculation is just too heavy. There is there's a lot of data crunching. We need to do something repetitively. Uh, a big grid search or tuning a machine learning module. So this does not fit into our single machine anymore. Uh, sometimes we can also have really not resource related um, reasons. There could be security compliance that we just cannot do things on our local computer and then the frameworks can actually help to uh, to proxy uh, doing things somewhere where the security compliance is, is met. Or even more simple, you just want to turn your computer off and you want to let some calculation run and you can also do it with the, the techniques I'm going to show. Uh, so basically two main drivers in or two main times of resources would be there for scaling out either memory or computing power. I mentioned CPU, but there's also other processing units, GPUs, um, whatever, whatever other PUs. Um, so the memory, typically, we would say the data do not fit into my or not my memory's computer. Uh, the symptoms out of memory kills, uh, operating system swapping out, uh, making your machine not responsive anymore. So that's how one would typically recognize there's something wrong with memory usage. And the other uh, type of resource is processing power. And the typical situation is the processing just takes too long. It still runs, but it's taking too long. Sometimes this can be confused with memory because as I mentioned before, if you start swapping, the, the computer starts to be slow. So there's, we, we need maybe also to look at um, processor usage or, or just uh, measure its temperature. If it's, if it's too hot, 
which can happen easily these days when there's 35 degrees. Uh, you, the, um, it's probably the processing power that we are lacking. Uh, before even doing that decision for scaling, uh, we should go through um, some checklist and, and check that we actually have taken all steps not to do that because we can be spending quite some budget on there and also our effort. So that scaling may not be that um, that fast and that efficient. So remember to profile your code and based on profiling, optimize. Usually there's 20% of the code base or even less uh, doing 80% of the work. So that's the, the well-known partial rule. Um, we can also take approaches of, to, for example, to save memory, to use memory mapping, and, and, and you still have data on, on hard drives or SSDs, uh, process data in chunks if, if possible. Uh, what, and uh, even if, so the, if, if we can still run on a, on a single machine, we don't need to do this big scaling out, uh, we can still use Dask or Ray for helping with that, for example, data chunking can be very straightforward with these uh, these tools. So now let's um, take uh, a look. Let's go through how we do, how we use um, Dask and Ray. And uh, under the hoods, I will not show that much about how it actually builds big uh, clusters. I will mention it, but under the hood, you can imagine the the resources of uh, what we use now can be can scale into into very large uh, scales. So Dask may be better known for its data frame pandas like API. However, it's a very uh, this is a quotation from the documentation. It's a Python library for parallel distributed processing, and it's fun. <laughs> um, uh, it is inspired heavily by Concurrent Futures API, as we will see soon, uh, but it can also scale to very big clusters. So let's uh, look at the, the API very quickly. It should not surprise us. Now we know what Concurrent Futures is. Instead of an executor, we have a client the client can submit similarly to what we saw in concur um, concurrent futures. And as a result, we get now a task future, um, which we can, uh, we can wait for. We can also get task futures. There are some differences like in the map behavior, but we, we would understand it um, when, we, when we use it. Uh, if we need 100% compatibility, Dask can provide in a concurrent futures executor uh, instance by the Dask client get executor method. This, so this is because the, the Dask, or actually Dask distributed client future is not 100% compatible with concurrent futures future. Um, at some point we probably need to decide whether to work with Dask native and use its specific features, which I will mention, or we just stick to concurrent features full compatibility. Uh, with Ray, Ray is on the level that I'm going to show very similar to Dask. I think it more focuses on machine learning, AI workloads, although it's also in Dask, so this is very um, kind of brief uh, comparison, brief introduction. The typical example of what, how we do things in Ray is we decorate a function with Ray remote decorator, and then we called it the, the resulting remote method to uh, do the same as submit, basically. It's, it really does more or less the same, it's just that the API is, is different, and to get the results, we use Ray get, usually. Um, so the the output is object ref, so it's not um, a concurrent futures future, 
but we can actually turn the result into a future by its future method. And there is a um, recently still active pull request to uh, implement a ray executor similar to what I showed for the ask. So we can get full concurrent futures compatibility if we, if we need to. Both these frameworks integrate well with async IO. Um, they just do it a bit uh, differently in, in syntax. The ask is maybe a bit straightforwardly because we can evade object refs from Ray, while the ask we need to switch the asynchronous modes on. But in both cases, we can get very straightforward integration with async IO and use evadeable, get evadeable objects uh, from the ask or Ray execution. Uh, the architecture, I don't want to go into details, but both basically have, if, if we spawn a cluster, we would get a scheduler node and worker nodes, and the scheduler would synchronize the work, and what, quite importantly, what is important for scaling is we have um, many multiple, very straightforwardly usable options to deploy on a big, in a big scale. To Kubernetes using uh, Kubernetes operators uh, on cloud, including a managed managed so solutions, or even to high performance computing job queues like PBS of Slarm, if that's uh, your cup of tea or coffee. Um, so, in, in what Dask and Ray solves on top of um, concurrent features is data management in the distributed world. So it tries to manage it efficiently. They take a bit different approaches under the hood, but on the top level, it's uh, just some management. It, it uh, stores it into in on the, the workers somehow. It stores data on workers if you want to. And it, uh, it also schedules tasks close to data if possible. And uh, very importantly, we can use references to data, so basically like remote data as inputs to our functions, which would not be possible with the concurrent futures directly. You would have to do that communication or resolution somehow manually. So an example with Ray puts, we put some data into the cluster, Ray does something, it stores it, and in, uh, in now we have a remote function, process data, and we can directly use process data remote on the data ref. Now remember, I could also use the data directly here and Ray would send it to the cluster, but since the data already exist in the cluster, they, they are just picked up by the task when it's executed in the cluster. So the communication serialization is largely reduced. Sim uh, similarly, we can use call graphs so we can because a result of a calculation is also an object reference or future, we can do the same as with, we did with data with results. So we can basically build uh, call graphs. So these sending futures references is, is, a, is a very, very powerful con, uh, concept uh, that both Ray and Dask uh, implement. Um, we can also do nested tasks. So uh, submit tasks from within tasks remotely. Uh, it may seem obvious, but if you try to do it maybe too much, you can enter a deadlocking uh, situation because you just don't have resources to schedule those, those tasks. So there are, there's ways in Dask and Ray to, uh, to deal with that. Uh, also importantly, we have we can put resource requests for tasks execution. Um, this is not available in concurrent futures. Both Dask and Ray can manage resources, which basically says how many slots for how big tasks are available on, on particular workers, so how much we can schedule, run at that point of time, or whether we need to wait for those resources to, um, to free. Uh, as an example, here's a 
how we do it with Ray. What's also important is we do it in runtime so we can base the resource request on, for example, data size that is, um, is to be processed. Um, we also get uh, fault tolerance. Don't want to go into details, but you probably know anything can fail in a software hardware world. So there's some means how Dask and Ray can recover. Um, so the challenges we have in distributed computing, the Dask and Ray can uh, help us, but we still need to be careful. Communication, software environment, so how we distribute Python packages across workers. Um, we also need to have observability logging because now things are happening somewhere remote and possibly authentication, authorization, and costs are also important for us. Choose between Ray and Dask. Uh, in a nutshell, based on what I said, there's not no big differences on the, the level that I've gone into. Both can manage big clusters and do asynchronous parallel computing. So it's probably the choice is more on other features. Maybe your already existing um, stack integrations and uh, and so on. That brings me to the summary. So what we've seen, Python provides powerful building concurrency obstruction and some basic implementation in, in, in particular concurrent features is the higher level interface to, to look at, to grasp these, uh, these obstructions. We can get quite seamless integration with async IO. And if we need to scale, we use frameworks like Dask or Ray that, um, that, can, that build upon the, the same obstructions but are able to s resolve some of the shortcomings like data serialization, communication, resource management, and can scale to very large clusters. And if you would like to have your slides, I'll have my slides. <laughs> Not your, um, just um, they are available at GitHub and also posted um, into, uh, into Discord. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention here. All right, thanks a lot for this very interesting talk. Um, we've already got questions on Discord. After the first question from Discord is answered, you can also please queue up on the front microphone here in the middle. Um, so the question was from Aina. I hope it was right. Um, I'm sorry if it was not pronounced correctly. Um, what's the difference between threading and concurrent.futures? Both provide ways to perform concurrent execution. I think very shortly, the threading module is more low level and it also open, it provides um, API for say lower level synchronization primitives like queues, um, logs um, and then stuff. So if you want to do more fine grained threading control, go into threading. But if the level of abstraction that, I sh that is in concurrent futures is the right level, I would say use uh, concurrent futures and rely on um, on that abstraction. And in inside concurrent futures, that pool executor, you would, if one goes into implementation into the source code, one would see threading module used inside. All right, yeah, f that was it from the internet. Um, for any questions, please queue up right now on the microphone. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I would like to ask uh, how friendly is Dask or Ray with uh, using with subprocess, basically, if you want to run something outside Python in your workflow? I would say very friendly. You can just very easily spawn subprocesses from a main, from your caller context. And you would get, um, you can also do threadings, but also subprocesses. So similarly to concurrent futures, process pool executor, Dask or Ray can do that locally too. 
if that was the <laughs> the question. If there is no further questions, then I would ask you to spend another round of applause for Jakub.